welcome to CD12. Today, I think I'll just show you a little bit about what we are and kind of the space that you're in, what it's used for, what's our vision. I want to keep this interactive, so if you have any questions, just uh, let me know. Yeah, so let's get started. Where you are right now uh, used to be the former Henderson Secondary School. This area has uh, a more severe aging population as compared to the rest of Singapore. If my statistics is uh, serving me right, I think it's about 13% uh, of the population here are 65 and above as compared to say 11% uh, on average. Uh, back in 2017, uh, the school was decommissioned because uh, not enough students uh, to be enrolled into the school. Right, so they had to close it down, merge the existing student population with another school nearby and then the whole compound was closed for about uh, two years. It was left abandoned. How can we inject new life, a brief new life into these spaces, especially bringing in the, the overarching themes of sustainability, food security, uh, and then at the same time designing the space such that it's very interactive, um, very engaging for the communities in the neighboring areas. Yeah, so uh, this is really our first space that we took over and shortly after operating, we unfortunately went into lockdown with the rest of the world. Uh, we've learned a lot as well over the past few years. We've seen the interest in, in the green movement and in, in climate action really taking off over the past few years as well. And it's also a reason why we are riding this wave and kind of understanding how we as social enterprises, how can we get them to really take concrete action uh, to, to do this together as a collective movement. Now. Okay, so where we are now, we are standing on what used to be the school field. Uh, with this, this part of the school field, we call it the Sustainability Centre. Uh, so this building behind you, uh, it's made with all recycled materials. So these two pillars are repurposed from a nursery that housed the plants uh, at Jewel. So when you guys flew in, I don't know whether you got a chance to visit Jewel, uh, but all the trees, before they were all transplanted into uh, the mall, uh, it had to be housed in a nursery, right? Uh, in the near, when, when the whole building was under construction. So when they tore it down, uh, all this steel was going to waste. So we brought them in and then uh, we used them again. So even, even these pillars are all from the nursery. Uh, and then the timber is actually a cross laminated plywood. It's actually recycled from the Singapore Management University building. So these are the leftovers, which is why you see a lot of imperfections, some blemishes here and there. We have a very pretty nice green wall on top. And uh, if you are able to look up, there's also a green roof. So these two features are actually things that would uh, reduce the direct impact of the sun which is why when you entered it was still quite cooling right? uh, and it's also to mitigate storm water runoff and we, we use this space to to really highlight to uh, the general public about different domains within sustainability so one part of course is about designing buildings uh, construction and design and growth uh, and then we will later see the different agricultural methodologies that we have here uh, and we have our signature farmers market here as well so every first saturday of the month uh, we will have farmers from our own allotment gardens or, and also farmers from other parts of singapore about 30 to 35 of them we will have booths uh, and it's a it's quite a lively marketplace so if you guys happen to be around uh, do visit us on the first saturday of the month this is only 10 square meters uh, and i believe you guys be familiar with the rice fields in say Thailand, Vietnam, yeah, or yeah. Malaysia. Uh, this is only 0.1% of what a normal rice field would be in terms of area. Uh, and anyone wants to guess within one single block like this how much rice? Mm -hmm. How much harvest? rice? Yeah, how how much, much kilograms? Yeah, yeah. How much kilograms? Five, ten, twenty. Five, ten. Oh, very <laughs> <obvious. laughs> Any other guesses? Uh, one kilogram. One. 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 Okay, you guys are quite close compared to... So I've had groups who tell me, okay, I get 10 bowls of rice. Uh, which is an un uh, not the usual way of measuring rice, right? So the fact that you guys got kilograms, I think it's, it's really good already. So a, a few... A, 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 an area like this will yield about 3 kilograms. I have some uh, grains to show you. Good, 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 good. So the grains that are green are... The immature ones. Okay, so if you if you ever go to a rice field, you can harvest this and then you give it a squeeze. So the, the outermost layer is the husk, right? So if you peel away the husk, 
you have the grain, but there's also still another layer mm. on the outside. Right, so the only difference between brown rice and white rice is this layer called the bread. So the bread is where all your nutrients are, your, your vitamins, your, yeah. your proteins. Mm. Right, so when you have whole, uh, whole grain or whole meal flour, they, they basically mill it with the bread on. White rice is, there is this additional step where they yeah. polish the grains yeah, the and then you take away the bread. Mm -hmm. So you're left with just the white grain. Yeah, so this is this is the, the mushroom fruiting chamber. Uh, so the logs, uh, we call those bags logs. Uh, they, are, they are sawdust uh, made from rubber wood. And then they are all inoculated with the mycelium bacteria. So when it comes here, we remove the lid from the log and then expose it to high humidity and the mushroom fruit. So we have two varieties here. One is the pearl oyster mushroom the flat, uh, flat disc shape and then we have one you can spot it looks a bit like a cauliflower right on the top okay uh, and then right behind me we have uh, our container farm half of it it's running on a hydroponic system and then the other half it's a mushroom uh, fruiting chamber we have curly kale and this is sweet basil one of you you are prat uh, prat yeah prat. yeah so he asked you know, how can powering the, a farm using or air conditioning be sustainable? Uh, a lot of farms in Singapore are moving indoors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, going vertical. And then uh, one big concern is the operating cost because of utilities, right? especially if you need air conditioning, if you need lights. So there are a few ways, uh, different companies, different uh, technology providers are trying to mitigate this, mm -hmm. which is through what they call smart solutions. La. So they deploy sensors. So the, the, the air conditioning, the lights, are all controlled such that they turn on only when necessary, right? So it's all very optimized. But still, that is it's a big problem because uh, energy, uh, uh, electricity is pretty expensive in Singapore. A lot of people are also experimenting on different ways of uh, altering light so that you don't actually need to use uh, artificial light, right? So how can we use sunlight uh, and then still grow indoors? And a lot of technology providers are working on that. I don't have the right answers to say how sustainable it is, but it's a constant debate because it's not just about the operating costs, it's also about the materials that you need to build uh, these towers, right? And uh, the solutions that you need to use in, in those uh, tanks. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it comes with so many other inputs when you need to grow food. So whether or not this is more sustainable, whether or not the more conventional way is more sustainable, uh, it's still a big question mark. I believe there are a lot of people working on it. So if you are interested, I think you will uncover quite a big uh, can of worms, I think. So yeah, very worth looking into, I think. Lastly, in the sustainability center, we have this aquaponics setup. So aquaponics basically just means the combination of aquaculture and hydroponics. So hydroponics is the soilless way of growing plants and then you combine it with aquaculture which is growing living things or animals in water. It's, it's a closed loop system. The fish waste, we pump it up into the tower. The waste will be used as nutrients. It will trickle down. And then the plants, the roots are like the natural filters. And then we have inlets in every tower and then it trickles down. For the farms adopting this methodology, they also use the fish as a revenue stream. So they sell the fish. So it actually supplements uh, their income, their revenue. Instead of just uh, selling plants which has usually a lower margin. Okay, this is called the cranberry hibiscus. Cranberry. Yeah, so the, the shape of the leaf is quite unique. Uh, it looks a bit like a maple tree, but maple leaf, but it's not a maple leaf. Uh, it has a very tangy, citrusy flavor. You can use it as a garnish for your salads. Uh, it provides nice color, nice pop of flavor. Uh, and it's in the Roselle and the Ladyfingers family. Uh, this this structure right here is uh, it's actually a, a very traditional and unique uh, structure. It's it's not really a tree house. Uh, it's actually, a, it's called a wayang stage. Wayang? Or thai, a wayang, yes. So it's traditionally used for uh, performances during the Hungry Ghost Festival. In the lunar calendar, right? At the seventh month, uh, it's the Hungry Ghost month, right? Oh, so yeah. the Chinese believe that putting up performances is a way to appease the spirits, right? So the reason why we have it here is not... People sometimes ask us, why do you put such an inauspicious uh, structure here in the middle of the, 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 the farm, right? But, uh, for us, we wanted to tell stories, right? One is to highlight the heritage and the history of the space, uh, the heritage of Bukit Merah or Red Hill. The world is changing so quickly, right? Uh, 
so we, we always have this North Star uh, that we always follow. So understanding what we are unique in, what, what we offer, uh, and kind of hanging tight to it, clinging on to it, it's, it's very important. Uh, and for us as a social enterprise, because I think we, we often get confused with charities or non-profit organizations. We, we are for profit, uh, but we are doing it for social cause. So I think people are getting more and more aware about this, uh, this differentiation. Uh, but for us, it's how do we make sure that we are still able to provide for the people who work for us, right? They are also making a, a living out of, of this job. But at the same time, balancing how can we uh, do good, how can we contribute back to society. So I think finding that balance, we are still navigating. We don't have the, the, the exact formula and the recipe yet. But I think that's very important if, if, if you are talking about social enterprises. And if you, if you look at how urban populations are going to double by I don't know, 2050 if I'm not wrong, there's an increasing need for green spaces because there's, there's always this very inherent connection between us and nature, right? So we still pray for that in, even if we live in a concrete jungle. It's going to be increasingly important that we look into park spaces, green spaces, how, how do we develop urban landscapes uh, and still remembering that we need to have green, green pockets of community space. Now. So I think bringing people in and breaking down those barriers I think, uh, and letting just people understand that you know food is really grown in, in this certain way. Uh, so we call this a biodigester. Uh, it takes in all kinds of food waste. So even your leftover fried rice, you know, if you're having tom yum soup, pad thai, whatever. <laughs> if you can't finish it, feed it to, through the funnel at the bottom. Uh, it's filled with anaerobic bacteria. So the bacteria gets a buffet, uh, gets a party when you feed it. Uh, they generate a byproduct when they consume the food waste, which is methane uh, or biogas. And this bag will inflate. The reason why it's so deflated now is because we had a cooking session last uh, yesterday. Oh, okay. So, so you, this you bag actually grows. grows. The moment you plug this in into a portable stove, mm -hmm. uh, you get yes, it's yes. a flammable gas, so you get mm -hmm. uh, a okay. stove, lah, a cooking yeah. stove, mm. and then you can do outdoor cooking here. Yeah. The kids they go crazy because they see how waste can be generated into energy. Mm. So again, for educational purposes, you can't have this in your apartment in Singapore. Uh, it's impossible because. Uh, you can actually smell it if you come closer. It's not the most pleasant smell, but it's the, it's the smell of nature. Yeah, and, and because food waste, it's, it's also such an important factor when you talk about uh, food security and, and sustainability. If I'm not wrong, uh, back in 2019, Singaporeans generated 700,000 tons, a million tons of food waste.